welcome here to the first official schedules of uh, session after all the keynotes and stuff. And we are going to talk about Azure Functions, but mostly about everything that is surrounding the function. All the cool things that you can do in Azure that can help you to keep your functions secure and safe. Uh, this does mean uh, that this is not going to focus too much on the code. Aww. But uh, bear with me, because the stuff around this is really cool and can really help you uh, when you're creating functions to make them all a little bit more secure and make them ready for an enterprise setting. Uh, let me introduce myself real quickly. My name is Barbara Forbes, and I am an Azure MVP as well as a GitHub star. I work as the Azure technical lead at OGD in the Netherlands. Uh, I write a blog on Azure automation and, of course, PowerShell, which you can find at Forbes with a 4.nl. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at BA4BES, and that is also my GitHub handle. First, I need to think, thank our sponsors who have made these events possible. Without sponsors, we won't have any of these events. So awesome that they're here and you can find them uh, right there in the lobby and uh, get to talk with them. So to start off, what's the difference between just playing around and having your lab and basically an enterprise environment? I could call this production, but enterprise sounds more cool. Um, basically, it's scale. So often uh, enterprise is a lot larger, a lot more requests. Uh, security is much more important because as soon as something is larger, there are also more people who are eager to break it. Uh, and how you deploy stuff. Instead of doing it from your uh, local environment and your home, you might need something more professional. And documentation is thingy as well. Documentation, writing clean code, but uh, we're not gonna focus on these one, but uh, I should mention them. So for this talk, we're gonna use uh, an example function uh, that we're gonna work with just so we have some, some feeling of what all these things that we're gonna talk about will do to a function. And this is my favorite example function. It is triggered by an HTTP request. So you do either info request method or in the browser, you do a request and the function starts running. And what the function will do is it will create a storage account. And the storage account needs a name. And uh, as most people know who work with storage accounts, uh, they need to be globally unique. And that can be a bit challenging. So I've made a storage account generator. It has a list of adjectives, a list of nouns. It takes one, two of them random, puts them together, checks if that name is available, which it mostly is because it's really crazy combinations. And uh, then it will create that storage account and it will send a result to you. So it will confirm to you that storage account has been created. This is an example of how that would use, look. So it has, uh, you add, give it a resource group name, uh, I use the URL here, and then I use info quest method, and it creates a storage account, acceptable hate. This is an example I couldn't just leave, uh, leave on, and I hope we will get some random results that we see in a second when I actually run one live. I've never had it gone dirty on me, and I hope it will not do it now. But we'll see, the results are often uh, good for a giggle. So the first thing we need to consider is scaling, because I'm playing around here and I'm doing some requests and creating some storage accounts. Uh, but if you have this in enterprise, there might be thousands of requests at the same time. And your uh, function needs to be able to handle that. So we have a few different SKUs you can run, use around function. You have the consumption plan, the premium plan, the app service plan. Now the app service plan is a lot like the premium plan, but you can also use it for other apps like web apps. And it's mostly recommended if you already have resources available somewhere uh, from an app service. Um, overall, it's a lot like a premium plan. And if you don't have resources available, they say go with the premium plan or the consumption plan. Consumption plan, you only pay for the runtime of your function. So that compute power. That means if your function never runs, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, even if your function does run, it can be very cheap. It's very cheap to play around with, which I think makes functions a lot of fun. Now, the premium plan, uh, I think it starts at about 150 euros a month and gets more expensive on that. The good news is you can run multiple functions on it. I think like 100 different function apps can run on one plan. But you do need to pay for stuff. 
what you get with the premium plan is a lot of the uh, features we will see when we're talking security. But the good news is you, you don't actually need it for scaling. Because scaling is built in to Azure Functions. Even on the consumption plan, if you get a lot of requests, it will collect more resources to make sure it can use those requests. And I've tested that uh, with Azure Load Tester. Uh, this is a relatively new tool. If you haven't used it before, check it out for a bit. It's really a lot of fun. What you can do with Load Tester is just um, pull, put a bunch of requests against a, a URL or a web app and see uh, how it works, how the response times are. And since this last week, since last week, you are able to just give it a URL and how many requests you want. So I went in, ran this on the function we just talked about. Uh, this was with 200 users in a consumption plan. You see it starts out a little slow, but it becomes quicker a lot very fast. So at one point it gets 200 users, 200 requests, and you see that it can handle that. Um, now this uh, function takes a bit of time because it creates a storage account, so it's never going to be very fast. So just to check, I basically created a hello world function, so it doesn't do anything really, so it doesn't need that compute power. And then I threw thousands, a thousand requests at them for uh, 120 seconds. And these were the results. And this is a consumption plan. This is basically a free plan. They have a startup time, so they do need to start up because a container is spun up at that point. And uh, they have to uh, figure out a way, oh, we're getting a lot of requests. And by then, the, fun the response time became very, very quick. So for scaling, good news, you don't need uh, a paid plan or an expensive plan. But there are other reasons to do that. And a lot of these reasons are the security reasons we're going to talk about now. Because as I said, with a lot of requests comes the part where people want to abuse your function and abuse the information that's behind it. So if we move back to our function, we're going to have some stuff surrounding that function to make sure that it works. One of these things is a managed identity. And I need that because this function needs to do something in my uh, tenant. It needs to create a storage account. And you can do that with credentials in PowerShell, uh, but then you need to store that credentials. It takes a lot of time, a lot of things to do. But you can do that natively with Manage Identity. With Manage Identity, your function itself becomes an entity in Azure AD. And you can use that entity to give permissions. So that's a great option to use always if you are letting your function do anything within uh, Azure, use a managed identity and um, you don't have to worry about authenticated or anything like that. There's one worry you can have about authentication, which is good to notice. Uh, you can use uh, system managed identities or user managed identities. System managed means it's really attached to your uh, function, where user managed identity is an, its own resource and you can attach it to multiple functions if you want to. So your AD might be a bit cleaner if you use it for a lot of different options. So that works really great, and I tried it with this one, and uh, one of the good things to notice is that um, in uh, the profile file that is connected to your function, there is a connect Azure AD commandlet that will only work if you have a system managed identity. If you have a user managed identity, you will want to uh, add the identity that you're going to use. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's not going to use. I'm going to do the questions in the end if you're all right with that. Yeah. <laughs> because otherwise, I'm going to totally get lost. I know myself on that one. <laughs> so uh, with a user managed identity, you do want to notify them on that uh, ID. And the good thing you can do is that if you do this with infrastructure as code, you can still make this kind of automated. And I have an example in that in the code that I'm going to share with you in the end. So we have an identity to securely have permissions in our Azure tenant. Uh, another thing you could use, but I actually didn't use here, is a connection to KeyFault. You don't want any credentials in your code. Probably already familiar with that concept, but still you don't want to do it. Uh, you can set those credentials directly in your application settings, uh, but you can also create a reference to KeyFault directory and use that managed identity to give it permissions to read stuff from your KeyFault. Really clean way to go and do it that way. Uh, the sad thing is I didn't need it for this one because I used an input binding. So the connection with the storage account is from an input binding, 
I didn't even need a connection to Keyfold. But it's good to know that that's an option that you should use. So now let's move back to that HTTP trigger. That example we just saw is just a URL, and everyone can call that URL. And uh, you can call it right now if you have a computer, and it will work. Um, because I am aware of that, I did did a slight change to the function code that it was actually not creating a storage account, which also makes it run faster. But if it is was creating a storage account, I could give you access to my tenant that way, which I don't want to do. So what you can do is create authentication on the function level. I can set it, uh, it's now set to anonymous, so everyone can request it. I can set it to a function level where a key needs to be added to the URL. And what would happen, because this is what we just saw, I could create a storage account with just a URL. And if I set the authentication to function level, it will give an error if I want to run it like this. So it says it's unauthorized. Which is good, but it feels kind of iffy to have that key be part of the URL. Just feels a little bit iffy. It's a plan. But are there other ways? Yes, there are. We can use authentication from an identity provider. Uh, this can be uh, Azure AD, this can be other Microsoft services, this can be Twitter, Facebook, and Google. I think those are the options. And the great things about this is that they're not that hard to set up. This is something you want to do on a web interface. If you have something in a browser, for example, you can use uh, the identity provider. And I'm going to show that real quickly. So I here have uh, one of my functions that generates a storage account. And if I go to the menu here, I can select authentication. And with authentication, I can add an identity provider. So it says Microsoft, Facebook, Google, or Twitter. I can choose one of them. And if I click that, I can select one of them here. And I'm going to use Microsoft because we're already there. You can see I can also choose GitHub, for example. And what it will do, it will create an app registration for me. So it makes it, it, again, an entity in my Azure AD. When I use Azure AD, this also means that I can add a group to that registration and say that only certain people are allowed to use this application. So I have some sort of permissions right here. And I can even say I want this to be able to use for personal Microsoft accounts or something like that. So it can go beyond my own Azure AD. But I'm going to leave everything at the default. Require that X authentication. And basically, it's just clicking add, and it will start adding it. And as soon as it added, that means that my uh, uh, function is no longer reachable through uh, the normal URL. And as this tends to always be slow when people are watching it, for some reason, I have prepared an example already. So this is what would happen first if you called my function in the browser. I think it's still on a slow start, so we're not going to see it probably. Delayed kit, nice. But if I add that authentication, it's going to say I require permissions. I need to be able to view your profile to do stuff and uh, confirm that you are who you say you are. And only after that will the function run. And I can show you in an in private window. I need to sign in. And this is just with the, oh, I used the wrong URL, but this is just with the URL like you would have here. Gesundheit. The frizzy upper, nice as well. It's almost frizzy popper, except that it's not. So it will uh, authenticate for me, and only after this I will be able to do anything in my function. So you see how quickly you can set that up, and how quickly you can make that work. And this is really a great way to make sure that our function is secure. So this is what we just saw. That's one of the ways you can secure access very quickly. Uh, now, as I said, this works well in the browser. It doesn't work that well when you do an infogress method or when you, when you use your function as an API, because at that point, uh, it will just give an error. It won't load that screen. So if you're doing that, you can take a look at API management, which you can use to have your functions behind. Uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to uh, go through that at this point, but that's also something that you can uh, consider if it's more of an API setting. Come on. Another issue we have. 
What's the problem with this screenshot? Exactly, they're not even subtle, subtle about it, it. By default, your function will always be reachable by HTTPS, but it's not enforced. So by default, if people use HTTP, it will work. And it will create the great storage account expensive can. And yeah, that's something we don't want because uh, that means our my traffic is unencrypted and I don't want that to happen because now it's silly storage account name. The next time it's your Azure AD user. And you don't want that stuff to be available. Good thing you can fix that pretty easily as well. So in our function menu, if we move to the TLS SSL settings, trigger this switch. The only thing you need to do. And as soon as this loaded, you won't be able to be reachable to HTTP. Of course, this is a little bit easier if you're using the default URL of azurewebsites.com because in that URL, the uh, certificate is embedded. So you don't have to worry about that. If you do this with your custom domain, of course, you need to add a certificate. If you're doing for testing, by the way, you can let an Azure app create uh, a certificate for you, which means it will still not trust that certificate, but it, for a testing environment, it, uh, that can be a solution. So now we have a secure way. We go through HTTPS. And now we just have one issue, and that's that our function is reachable for the whole world. And we've got kind of used to that. When we went into cloud, when we went into Azure, we thought, well, Azure, it's a cloud product. So yeah, we don't need to network anymore. We've got identity and then that's fine. But identity is not enough. It's never a bad idea to uh, have as much protection as you can. And we need to move back a little bit as we decide that with zero trust, we also need the network. It's still a very important part of keeping your app safe. Because why would your app be available all over the world, for example, if it's an internal app? You don't want to use that. And we have some great network settings, and the network settings are one of the examples of things you can only use in a premium plan. And this is the menu you get in Azure. I really like that menu because it really shows the whole process, shows everything that happens. And it's actually a big screen. You might have been able to read it. But let's first look at what we can do with the inbound traffic. Uh, with the inbound traffic, the most simple way is access restriction, which is basically a firewall. With access restriction, we can say uh, we only want certain VNets to be able to uh, run this function, or we only want certain public IPs to be able to run it. So we can keep it secure that way. By default, the, your function is open to the whole wild world and everyone who wants to try something there. So that's the simplest way to implement security there. The better way is private endpoints. Private endpoints are coming available at, uh, at a lot more Azure resources all the time. And what you do with your private endpoints is you basically create a secure network inside of your organization. So you have a VNet and your function gets its own private IP which in that VNet. And all traffic will be through the Azure and the Microsoft backbone. No traffic going around it, so uh, you won't be able to reach it publicly, and that makes it a lot more secure. And this is even usable if you, have, if you don't have an uh, on-premise environment, because we're used to the local network being a thing on-prem, but here you can have your backend and your front end connect to each other through a private endpoint, and never en will anything be available on the internet if it doesn't have to. And the good thing is, this is also not hard to implement. So we're going to look at that. And I have this one there for that. So uh, we are on our menu, and I've already opened up the network, but the network can be found right here. It's a little bit different here because I'm zoomed in quite a bit, so I hope everyone is able to see it. And here I have those private endpoints, so I can click those. And I can just add one. So there's an add button right here at the top. I can give it a name, of course, with your very good and custom naming convention. So endpoint. <laughs> I select uh, one of my networks that I have, and this is the one I want to use. This is my enterprise network. I only want this to be available either internally or through everything else that has access to that network. Uh, I add it to a subnet, and I can integrate it with a DNS on. 
uh, DNS zone, you can have it create their custom one, but mostly what you see is there's their one uh, internal private DNS zone for uh, your whole network. So if I click OK now, it's just going to add that private endpoint, and basically this is all there is to it. Everything will be created for you. So uh, what will happen, so this was the old version. See, let's see what it will come up next. Bogus cabinet. Nice. One more. Imperfect increase. Okay. We can all think of an example of an imperfect increase. Really no idea. But what it will look like in the end uh, is like this. There is here a connection, private endpoint, and my web app will show this. So this is basically the same URL, different number, but the same URL. And it just said you are trying to uh, attempt, attempting to reach a web app that is not available. So that's really how simple it is. This isn't a lot of work. It does take planning. You have to plan how you do this in your network. Uh, because we uh, sometimes with networking we have uh, the tendency to uh, just allow all Azure resources or just add every service that we see and then we break our network open to the internet again, which wasn't really the point. So it still, still takes some planning, but on the private endpoint side, this is how easily you can implement that. So that's on the inbound traffic. But there's also outbound traffic, which I want to mention because I've seen there are some people who are a bit confused about this. Uh, first, the one on the low end is a hybrid connection. With a hybrid connection, you connect to an on-premise environment and you can have your function run on a virtual machine or on a container in a local environment. I have personally never had a use case to use this. Um, because I often see if you want to do PowerShell automation in an on-premise environment, it has something to do with Active Directory. And these hybrid connections will not work on a domain joint machine, so you cannot have it work with uh, Active Directory. So in practice, I always see that people are using uh, hybrid agents from automation accounts if they want to run PowerShell on a local environment from Azure. But it is an option that is available. Uh, now, the VNet integration can also be a bit confusing because this is the traffic to the VNet, but the other way around. So, if you set this to on, this will give your uh, function access to all the resources that are in the VNet. And will be able to use those, but not the other way around. So, your resources won't be have access to that function. So, that's something to consider. Uh, what you can consider here is what does this function actually need? Does it need access to all the other resources? Uh, do the other resources need access to that function? If that is the case, you would reuse that private endpoint we just saw, but if it's only the other way around, so maybe there's a storage account in your uh, VNet with a private endpoint as well, and you can create a connection through there. Otherwise, you don't have to use VNet integration. So um, I've seen a lot that people just keep uh, turning stuff on until it accidentally works. But this is a good thing to consider which one you actually need. So we have now uh, secured our function, our networking around it, and we have that identity and we have authentication. And now we want to deploy stuff. There's a lot of ways to deploy to uh, deploy a function, but uh, these are mostly it. You can deploy to the portal, to Visual Studio Code, or pipelines, either Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions, or something else. And um, to walk through them, I think the portal is one of the greatest ways if you're starting out with Azure Functions. Because the portal helps you to visualize stuff. And there is a lot of visualization about how the functions are connected with each other. You never work with functions, or if you're doing a binding that you've never used before, portal is always the way to go. But after that, you want to probably move to Visual Studio Code, because you can deploy directly from Visual Studio Code, and you can develop stuff locally. And every function I've worked in here is all created through Visual Studio Code. It's great when you're developing stuff, when you're getting to know stuff, and it really helps you with uh, seeing the results right away. But it's still from your local environment, and that becomes a problem when you're working with a team, which I hope is the case if you're doing enterprise stuff. Fingers crossed. <laughs> if you're working with a team, you uh, want something more consistent. 
And pipelines can help you do that. You can make sure that everyone deploys in the exact same way because it's all automated, which also saves a lot of time. So you can automatically deploy everything from there. Um, and you can have it be triggered on a pull request or on a push so that you always know that the code that is in your environment in Azure is the same as the code in your Git environment. So how does that look? Uh, I've taken GitHub Actions as an example here. Uh, Azure DevOps does pretty much the same. They have the same options. So what's the first thing we do? Of course, we do pester testing. You can pester test the code that's in your function. Check if everything is working as you want. I need to mention this very cool t-shirt that I got from Jacob this morning. Um, if you are jealous and you think I want that t-shirt as well, he has a session this afternoon and I think he's giving some of them away. Just a small tip. Um, but again, uh, Pester is a tool you can use uh, to uh, test your PowerShell and you can do that uh, in your pipeline. After that, that, we need to deploy the pipeline. And this is a point where we can have a bit of a discussion. Does this fit in the pipeline that deploys the code or does it need a separate pipeline? I deployed this one with Bicep. If you have not worked with Bicep yet, it is a wrapper around ARM templates and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot simpler than ARM templates and a lot more flexible. Great to work with. And yeah, I was thinking, should that be in this pipeline? This pipeline is to deploy the code. Is that the same place where you deploy the resource? And I think the correct answer is it depends. Because if you have an Azure team, so someone who is responsible for all deploying all the resources, then it makes sense that this is, the deployment is part of their own pipeline. But if that's not the case, if people are able to deploy everything themselves, all of these settings we just saw, all the security settings are part of that deployment, not part of the code. So it might actually be a good idea to have them be in the same category. And you can actually do pester uh, testing on this as well because it creates a JSON output and you can collect that and do password testing on it with PowerShell. Uh, so you can actually test if all the security is where you want it to be. There are other tools to do that, but this is one way to do it. So uh, it depends and uh, you need to use, look at your use case, but I have uh, added it here to this pipeline. We're deploying that function. And after we deploy the function, we want to deploy the code that's part of the function. And this is the default action that is available uh, from Azure. So uh, official Azure deployment for the code in a function. And what this does, this screenshot is uh, from their documentation, basically. And what they require, they need a function app name. So the name of the function, okay, we can do that. Um, they need the path to a package which can either be a zip file or just the path where all your code is located. It sounds hard, it's not that bad. So you can just use the path where you can uh, find all your code. And then the publish profile. Publish profile is something you can get from the portal uh, or with PowerShell, of course. And with the function profile, you're able to deploy stuff to uh, your functions. So it's basically, yeah, it comes in the place of the secrets that you would otherwise use. And what you see here is that they store the function profile, the publish profile in the secrets. And secrets is part of GitHub where you can uh, store secrets and then connect through Azure of uh, GitHub Actions. But that sounds like a manual job. We didn't want to do stuff manually. So there's a solution for that. I'm gonna park this right here. So we are gonna use this one, but we're gonna use a different way to get that publish profile. The publish profile, like I said, it's a button in the Azure portal. If you open your function, it's at the top menu. You can get the publish profile. Good thing is that uh, GitHub Actions are community-based. And Justin, you already created a f an action for this. And this action will collect that publish profile for you. The fun thing, by the way, on uh, every action from GitHub is that you can always see the source code because the source code is basically the name of the function, uh, uh, the name of the action in the GitHub URL. So github.com slash and then the name of the action. And this is purely PowerShell, nothing else going on. 
This is just using PowerShell in the back end. But this is a clean way to add it to your pipeline. And this will get the information for the publish profile, and you can add it on to that uh, next step that we just talked about. So we now have uh, tested our app, we have uh, deployed it, we had the publish profile, and now we have deployed the code. Now our publish profile is plain text in our output, which isn't ideal, and we got it. And there is a great solution for that, and that is the uh, button that's beside this one, which is reset publish profile. You can reset it at any point you want, and it will just regenerate that information, and your old information will do nothing anymore. And the good thing is that that action that was created by uh, Justin Yu is also able to do that. So we add that action again at the end, and uh, we have now deployed our action, uh, deployed our function, uh, left it all secure, and we start running again. Also the reset thing, uh, purely PowerShell, nothing else. The fact that it's purely PowerShell and you can see that code means that you can very easily take this information into Azure DevOps. They also have the function uh, task you can use, and this way you can get this uh, in Azure DevOps. And this is what it would look like when all the nice pictures are gone and it's all just text. So you have a login, log uh, you deploy the bicep template. I don't have the pester tests in here, but that's, uh, you should have them beforehand. Collect the publish profile, deploy the function, and then reset the publish profile. So that's how you would securely deploy that function. That means I'm pretty much at the end of what you can do to extra, extra secure your functions and stuff like that. There are some other sessions coming up about Azure Functions. I think that's a great way to work with PowerShell. So uh, I truly recommend it. We have one tomorrow and one on Wednesday, uh, both on different part of functions. So I recommend you visit those. Um, if you like this stuff, I have uh, added my uh, GitHub a repository where all the code that I use for both the function, the bicep file, and uh, the deployment around it are all available. Uh, this one is already publicly available, and I will be added it, adding it to the PowerShell conference repository, of course, but I haven't done that before, not yet. Uh, if you're a little new to functions, or you want to know more about functions, how they work, and all the different bindings and durable functions, and how you deploy them, I have a lot of step-by-step -step guides on my blog, which is Forbes with a 4.nl. And yeah, if you come up with questions after our questions round, if you're lying in bed this night and say, oh, now I have a question, you can always read me on Twitter. And that's pretty much it for me, and I forgot the question and answer slide I see, so I'll leave this one up. But uh, we can uh, do some questions later. But at this point, I want to thank you, everyone, for joining this session. <laughs> yeah, you were the first. <laughs> well, yeah, I said, you said that if you uh, want to do uh, private endpoints, it's really simple in the portal. How simple is it if you do infrastructure as code? Because you said it's magically everything happens. Uh, is it a lot of work to code? Uh, no, uh, it's, it's almost magic. It's in uh, Bicep, it's a separate resource, and in ARM templates as well, uh, which is called Private Endpoint. And it's just one separate resource. The question, by the way, was how easily can you do a private endpoint in Infrastructure as Code? So it's a separate resource that you create next to it, and um, I usually, in my Bicep files, I somewhere have a parameter that says needs private endpoint or has private endpoints, and you can even do them conditionally, whether you need them or not. The DNS zone gets uh, created as well? Yeah, but in most cases, you have one DNS zone for everything, so you want to deploy them separately. Okay. Yeah. Yes? That is a great question, actually. So can you use conditional access to, condition, uh, to use your functions? I'm not sure, actually, if you can say you want specific conditional access for your function. But you are able, so all your conditional access rules that you already have will apply. Exactly. You've got some policies that we already have in place for the organization. Yeah, they will apply. So if you uh, require MFA, you, it will also require it for the function. Okay. So that adds it. 
that's one of the great things, I think, about adding this. You get all, everything that Azure AD can do. Yeah? Do you mind taking off really in one second? I'm going to walk to you. <laughs> Yeah, great question. Is there any reason why HTTP calls are available by default? No idea. <laughs> it's it, it all, all of Azure has it. Uh, this is something if you're working with Azure to keep track of. It's enabled by default for web apps, for um, uh, SQL stuff. Everything has HTTP is not enforced by default. By the way, something I only recently learned, uh, FTP is also enabled by default. Who has ever deployed a function with FTP? <laughs> yep, no, no. That's where you say, yep, no. <laughs> so that's a good thing to watch out for as well. Uh, you can uh, disable it in your infrastructure as code or uh, by pushing manually, but that takes a lot of time. But to encourage people, you don't need it, so disable it if you can. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to deploy an Azure function with a private endpoint on the storage account when deploying it? Because if you click it in the portal, you don't get the option to select private endpoints for the storage account itself. And I've tried it through ARM, but then it just, my deployment keeps failing, but then I had an extra task that sets the private endpoint. But is it possible to do it in one go? Okay, so the question, if you can deploy a private endpoint on a function or a storage account or whatever while you are deploying the resource itself. And with ARM, if it's not working, it's probably a dependency thing. Um, so there's a dependency. It, the private endpoint needs to wait for the resource to become available. But you can do that without any issue. And yeah, I haven't worked in ARM anymore since I started working with Bicep. <laughs> I'm a big Bicep fan for people who don't know it. And in Bicep, it fixes that dependency automatically. And in ARM, you probably have to set it, but it should be possible without issues. So, anyone else? It's not a question, I just want to promote my own session because it also has Azure Functions and it's the next session. Did I miss that? Because I did a search for. Oh, because I did a search on functions. Your next session, and what what is the title? Cool. So everyone needs to head to track two after this. No, awesome. Because functions are awesome, so everyone should be working with them. So, uh, move to the next slide. <laughs> yeah? No, I think it doesn't. No. I'm not sure why. No, I'm not sure. Yeah, what you see overall, if it's very, uh, is something in demand for enterprises, then it becomes premium. Because, yeah, overall, the, are there Microsoft people here? No, right? I can talk? Yeah. Overall, that's what, what they do. If it becomes premium, uh, companies don't mind paying that. What you do see, by the way, which has nothing to do with anything, is that private endpoint becomes available at uh, a lot more levels. So in app service, you can always already do it at the dev plan. So they are promoting stuff. But the Docker containers, yeah, that's pretty specific. So I think that's why uh, they did it like that. And there are some strange things out there. If you use Linux plans or Windows plans, it also makes some differences. So it's good to, uh, there are some Microsoft documentations that really just put those plans together and list all the differences. It can really help. Yeah? Uh, yes, so the question is, is uh, what is Bicep? Is it similar to Terraform? Uh, Bicep is like a cross between Terraform and ARM templates, uh, except that it's made by the Azure team. So it's always up to date, and it doesn't have a state file, which I really didn't like the state file. So, <laughs> But it's made by the Azure team who made ARM templates, and uh, it's a wrapper around the ARM templates, where uh, the syntax is uh, simpler, so it's not JSON, so there's not a hundred and thousands of columns and brackets. 
So the syntax is simpler and you are more easily able to create loops, have multiple re resources deploy at once. Uh, if you're not familiar and Bicep, you want to know more about it, there are some great Microsoft Learn modules on it. They've completed a complete track. If you are familiar with it, also go to that Microsoft Learn module because I learned something when I did them and I've been working with Bicep for a year. So uh, yeah, that's an awesome resource. Side track. Uh, we do have some time if anyone... All right, well, cool. Uh, if you have any questions coming up, I'm going to be here all the week. You can always ask me anywhere or on Twitter on a lady, later moment. So thanks, everyone, and enjoy five minutes up. <laughs> <laughs>